Okay, so again, we're going to warm up with 4.4, question number 12. And if it says, complete the following diagram using the processes used in photosynthesis, photosynthesis and the reactants in the products. So if I say, what are the processes of photosynthesis, what should you say? Light reaction and Calvin cycle. Right, okay. So where on our diagram do you think that we should be writing those? So this boils down to you. Where does the light reaction happen? Mm -hmm. And then you need to recognize that this is a chloroplast and this is the stroma. They are not showing you a picture of a cell. Cytoplasm would be out here. Okay. All right. And again, I can call these steps of photosynthesis. I can call them metabolic processes, pathways of photosystem the reactions of photosystem. So there's a lot of different names and you need to understand that I'm asking for like the light re dependent reaction, the light independent reaction. Okay. All right. Um, with this one, I think it's pretty easy to figure out which one's light, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and indicate because it says reactants and products. So here's what else we need to make. We need to put in light. We need to put in water. We need to put in CO2. And you need to note that two of these are used in one process. One of them is used in the other process. Okay. Where is CO2 used? You guys need to. In the cycle. Right. It's the one that enters. Remember, we've been, we've been showing this several times. We drew this, right? Okay. So from that diagram, you should be able to find a similar diagram on number eight, because that was where the CO2 is being utilized. Okay, what should we put here coming out? And it looks like we have several things, right? What could we put here? I put CHO. Okay, so we could put CHO. Any other things that we could put there? CHO would represent a, a sugar, right? What else? What are you going to say, Riley? O2. O2? O2 is oxygen isn't made in this one. CO2 goes in and out comes. I'll give you a hint. It has three carbon atoms is usually what we show coming out. Right, it's at G3P, which is a molecule that can be made into several different organic molecules. Now, primarily, it's going to say G3P is made into glucose, and then therefore, then the glucose is going to move out. Okay? Um, light independent reaction. Light dependent reaction. Okay, we have light. We have CO2. Okay, so let's talk about this kind of cycle. So we said to take CO2 and organize it into sugar, that takes energy. What would supply the energy? ATP. Awesome. So if we put ATP, so this shows you that ATP is made in the light reaction. And what was the molecule that's going to carry the hydrogens that we can use to reduce the CO2 into a sugar? NADP. NADP. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those are recycled back. So once that ATP is used, now we have it in pieces, but it can be put back together. That NADP plus is coming back. Where did the H go? In the glucose. Right. It added to the CO2, right? So it get, got put on these carbon atoms from the CO2 to have H and C and O. So we can start organic molecules, the blend of organic molecules. Okay. And where did this H come from? Water. Very good. Remember, we, we, or we color-coded it. So that H actually comes from the splitting of water. So the H's then go here, and oxygen is a byproduct. All right, so hopefully that was pretty easy. All right, let's jump into worksheet 4.5. And 
Again, I apologize. If you have already, like before class today, if you had 4.5 printed off from Google Classroom, it is probably the wrong one. So this is what the 4.5 should look like. It is now in Google Classroom. It is correct now in Google Classroom. If you want to open up real quick um, to refer to it, or if you can print it out real quick, go for it. We're also going to need 4.6. If you picked up handouts from me, then you would have gotten the correct ones, 4.5 that I printed off is correct. And again, just note, you guys can come and pick those things up if you want some paper copies from me, if that makes it easier. All right, well, let's talk about um, this technique that we can use using very simple supplies to determine rate of photosynthesis in different situations. So I could take my plant cells here and I could put them in uh, white light. I could take plant cells and I can put them under red light. I could put these in the refrigerator and we can see what happened with rate of photosynthesis. I can put them in a warm water bath. Okay, so we can manipulate the environment and see how that's going to affect rate. Okay, we've already talked about um, changing factors and how that can affect reaction rates. And photosynthesis and, and respiration is just a bunch of reactions that take place one after the other. And they're affected by um, environmental factors as well. Um, so let's just review for any reaction, not just photosynthesis, what does a change in temperature, how does that affect the rate of the reaction? Is my line straight up? Does my line go up and level off? Is my line a hill? Up and down. There you go. Okay. Because as you add temperature, these molecules can move around faster. So reaction rate goes up, but all of those reactions, there's an enzyme that did those. So changing the temperature too much, getting it too high can cause them to lose their shape. And then they can't bind to these substrates um, and transfer protons and electrons and so on. Okay. All right. Notice, what do you see on this graph here, on these graphs that you see here? What did you notice about what they're labeled? How do those relate? So those are all the reactants. And you know that if you increase the concentration of the reactants, that past a certain point, giving them more reactants isn't going to make them go any faster. So CO2 being turned into an organic molecule, those reactions can only happen so fast. So adding more CO2 to a plant is not going to allow those enzymes to work any faster. They're saturated. Okay. So all of these graphs go up and level off, go up and level off. Okay. All right, you should have that equation for photosynthesis memorized. So CO2, water, sometimes they will put the energy that's being used over the arrow. So don't be confused if it's written like this. And we make those organic molecules, primarily glucose, oxygen is a byproduct. Let's balance it. Is it, is the numbers that we put in front of those called coefficients? Chemistry people, it's been too long since I've been in chemistry class. Yeah. Oh, I actually remember something. Okay. So what coefficient am I going to put in the majority of these molecules? Six. There you go. Six, six, six. Photosynthesis is an evil process. Okay. All right. Now, notice these don't affect rate. So watch out for tricky questions. Products are not going to affect the rate of photosynthesis. So if you'll see questions like, you know, what's going to happen to the rate of photosynthesis if oxygen concentration is increased? Nothing, because it's a product. Okay. If glucose could affect photosynthesis rate, we would sprinkle sugar on plants. Do we do that to help them grow? No, we don't. Okay. So changing those products isn't going to affect the rate. All right. Now, if we want to calculate, we want to put this in an environment and see how fast photosynthesis is taking place in these cells, um, then we can use this setup. This is called the uh, leaf disc assay test. And this is basically what we're going to do is they're floating because they're full of oxygen. You can see they're at the top. So what we want to do is we're going to pull the oxygen out and then as they do photosynthesis, they will make oxygen again. They will become buoyant and they'll rise. 
And how fast they rise is an indication of how fast they're doing photosynthesis in that environment. So to get the oxygen out, I am going to change the pressure. Okay, I'm going to use a change in volume and a change in pressure to suck the oxygen out of these. And I'm going to refocus here to see if you can see it a little bit better here. Come on, you can do it. All right, I wanted to show you because you'll see the oxygen come out. So whenever I pull these down, it didn't work very well. I have too much air in there. Let me try this again. Let's use my finger. I'll take one for the team here. Okay, so I'm going to pull this down. Ah, do you see all the bubbles? It looks like it's in Sprite. If you think of all those bubbles. Those weren't there before. So look, this is what they look like before. And whenever you do this, it pulls the gas out of the plant. And then with that gas being gone, look what happens. They sink. Now, if they do photosynthesis, they'll make oxygen and they'll rise, right? So we can use how fast they rise, a time as an indication of rate, okay? Now, what we usually do is we take those, we can take those discs that we just made sink and we can put them in different situations. So for example, if you wanna see how temperature can affect the rate of photosynthesis of those plant cells, then I can dump them in a warm water bath, and they will all go to the bottom. I can put them in a cold water bath. All right. And then I got to collect data so we can make a decision on how temperature is affecting rate of photosynthesis. Okay. So we have this value that we can use to help us calculate rate. And that value is called ET50. And this stands for estimated time. When... 50% of the disc float. So when half the disc float, I call it. I have a time. It's called my ET50. Okay. So you have to watch out for um, different scenarios. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So whenever I'm watching these, whenever four go up, I call it. I'll figure out my time when four hit the surface. And that's my ET50. Okay. With the cold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I would probably want to put an even number in there for 10. In this case, when five are up, I can call it my ET50 value. All right, now what are we going to do with that? Well, if we have a number, like if my ET50, let's say my ET50 is, it took 10 minutes. If my ET50 is 10 minutes. Okay, I have a time. Well, great, because if I have a time, I can calculate a rate. So remember, rate equals, we have a number on top over time. So to calculate rate in this situation, we're going to use an arbitrary number of one at the top. I had students putting four. I had students putting five on the top. What do you think they were using incorrectly? What numbers were they going with? They were using the disks. That's not the number on the top. You're always going to put one, okay? One's going to be a constant divided by our time. That's our ET50. So if our ET50 was 10, then we're going to be one divided by 10 minutes, okay? And that's a rate. So now let's read some graphs to see if we can figure out some ET50. So if students are doing this experiment and they are just plotting how many disks have floated, okay? And so you can kind of see here at time zero, none are up. At minute one, I thought my numbers were off there. None are up, okay? 
When was the first minute that we finally have a disc floating, according to this first graph? Four. Yeah, at four, we finally had one up. Okay, that was that's exciting time. When we're actually doing this lab, and like one starts to go, you're like, it's working, it's alive. Okay. Well, again, we have to pay attention to how many discs got put into um, our reaction chamber, 14. So we have to figure out when seven are up. So what's my ET50 value when seven have risen? Nine and a half. Um, I would call it nine. This didn't print off very well. Does that make sense? Nine? So the nine minute mark, half were up, okay? By the way, why don't we just wait for all 14? And then write down a time when all 14 are up. Why are we doing this ET50? Hold on just a second. To avoid skewed data. Hey, did you get oh, hey, thanks. Okay. Um, skewed data, and here's the reason why it gets skewed. When we actually do this lab, we noted a problem. Students were sitting forever trying to get even just half of them up. And they're like, Miss Spencer, we've been here for 90 minutes. Should we call it? <laughs> And here's the reason why. And they would pick up, well, they would pick up their glass and they would come to walk in at the end of class and every single one of them would float to the top. And we we're like, what the heck just happened? These discs will stick to the edge of the cup. Sometimes they stick to the bottom. Sometimes they'll be flat and they'll come up on their edge, but they're still stuck by the edge. So usually what I have students do whenever they're doing this experiment is I just have them stir to move them to see, and that like will disbar or di, you know dis uh, will release them if they are stuck. Okay, so here's the thing: is you can get them, they can stick, and then that's really going to skew your data. So that's why we don't want like a total amount of time it takes. Um, that's why we don't take an average for each of the 14 discs is because some will never make it to the top because they'll just be stuck to the bottom. So instead, if we use ET50, that is called a median value. That's going to be a center value that we can use. And so then it prevents um, the data from being skewed by outliers, stuck chads. By the way, those little discs can also be called chads, floating chads. All right. So to calculate my rate, so remember, this is how we get to rate. Of photosynthesis is just one over ET50. So one over nine is going to give us our rate of photosynthesis. Okay, let's practice with this other graph. What do you think I should put for my ET50 time? That's whenever we would have half of these up. A minute. 21. Say that again. 21. There you go. 21. It's right here. We ended up with five have floated at that moment. So one over 21 would give me my ET50 value. Okay. All right. Now, let's see if we could then, let's think about this calculation right here. If you increase the amount of time, that's a bottom number, then what happens to rate? If time goes up, what happens to rate? It's inverse relationship. It goes down. Okay. So why don't you take a look at number four and see if you can tell me, according to this data, which CO2 concentration had the highest rate of photosynthesis. Ten. Okay. So sorry, rate equals one over ET50. You want the highest rate, then you better have the one with the lowest time because that means that they shot up very quickly because they're producing a lot of oxygen and that oxygen that makes them come up, okay? All right, so a little test for you. I've got some data here and I know I don't have the rates calculated, not that big of a deal. So you are gonna be asked to graph this data from this table. That's on the back side. It says, create a graph to show how changing CO2 concentrations would affect photosynthetic rate. 
All I want you to do is label your axis. And I want you to put the numbers, but only the numbers for CO2 concentration. Okay. So I want you to take a second to, if they asked you to do this, what would you label your axis? And then go ahead and put your CO2 concentration numbers on your graph. And if you just, if you don't have this paper, they can just do it on like scrap paper real quick. I'm going to leave it on this table. So if you need to use the data from this table. And again, it says, show how a change in CO2 concentration affects the rate of photosynthesis. Only 5% of students actually got their point for what we were doing. When you feel like you have those done, I just want you to put your hand up on your screen. When you feel like you have your graph set up correctly. You said uh, how increase of CO2 affects rate, right? Right. It says yeah. show how a change in CO2 concentration affects rate of photosynthesis. All right, let's see how we would have done. See if we can beat that 5% that we usually get. Okay, so first of all, anytime when they tell you to graph, they're going to tell you your two axis. If they show how changing CO2 concentrations affect photosynthetic rate, those are your two labels, okay? If there's a, a table that has the data, then you can just flat out take what they put for their labels and rewrite them on the correct axis, okay? So you should have CO2 concentration down here, rate of photosynthesis here, okay? You still would not get your point if this is all that you put. And one thing that I wanna point out is when you're graphing information from a table, you have to make sure, like if they indicate the units, that's exactly the units you have to put to. And this is where students messed up, is you did not put this as a unit. That's a unit. That's what would have given you a point for labeling correctly. 
you put exactly what is on that column. That's the units. You had to show me how this rate was calculated. You also could have put, because ET50 is a time, so let's say it was like one over nine minutes. You could also put for units one over minute. But I would just pull off exactly what is on top of the column of the table, okay? All right, if you have that, you still got zero points because you have to make sure that you have your units here. You can either put it here or you could put it on the numbers, okay? So if you put it at 1%, if you put a percent there, you're fine with your units. You don't have to put it there, okay? And then let's watch out for spacing. If two boxes is a value of one, then every two boxes is a value of one, okay? And notice I don't have a data point for 3%, but that's okay. You can go ahead and put 3%. Here, it's a placeholder. Also, this should help you guys. If you say that this is the 2% line and you're graphing the 2% rate and you come up here and you put it here on the wrong line, you just missed another easy point. Make sure that you, if I were you, I would put tick marks where each line is so you don't accidentally get off. Like for example, if you put like a 4% here, okay, and you put the data point over here, you just missed a point because the 4% mark is right here, okay? So we just wanna do whatever we can to make sure that we don't make really easy points and you lose these easy points and now you're a three instead of a four or you're four instead of a five because of a few easy points. Okay, so I like to put those little tick marks like that, okay? All right, if you want zero and two and then you put a five here and you put a 10, you would have lost a lot of points. Actually, your plotting data would have been off because it'll look different when you had your, your plots done um, and then your axis would be off as well, okay? All right, when you see questions like this, draw a conclusion, show how changing substrate concentration affects rate. When you go to answer that, you want to say as sub, substrate concentration, fill it in. You could say increases. You can say decreases. I'm going to go with increases. It doesn't matter. A substrate concentration increases. Rate of photosynthesis. Tell me what happens. Probably increases increases and then levels off, something like that, okay? All right, going on to 4.6, here's 4.6, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and just give you guys some example data for you to use to ultimately complete this. Um, I'm going to say that I put some chads in a cold water bath at 10 degrees Celsius. I'm going to do another one. Um, I'm gonna do room temperature about 26 degrees Celsius and then hot. I'm gonna do about 40 degrees Celsius, okay? I'm gonna give you some values here. In the hot, my reaction rate was, or my ET50 time, do about 20. I'm going to do cold. It took about 15. And warm, I'm going to put it at 7. Okay. Now, ultimately, I do want you to calculate the rates, figure out your graph, plot your data points, draw a conclusion. But really, one of the most reasons why I'm having you do this is because you guys are going to have to figure out some tricky numbers. You've got decimals, you'll have decimals. And sometimes when we have decimals that we're putting here on the y-axis, it trips us up, okay? So I just want you to practice a graph where you're counting up and it's not by a whole number, it's by decimals, okay? So ultimately, I do want you to do this front page. 
However, I'm going to put you guys in your breakout rooms and I want you guys to start on the back. Okay. I don't care what breakout room you go into, but I am taking role and using that to put down my role in power school. So make sure you're in a breakout room. I posted the links. If you want, just hold up like, so the people that usually work with know that, hey, I'm going to room one, or you can put up, I'm going to go five. And so then other people want to join you. Great. Okay. And again, when you guys get there, I want you to work on the back page first and then flip it over and do the front. And that'll probably take us pretty much to the end of the block. Okay. All right. Those rooms are up and running. So you can go ahead and start making your way there. Also, someone might want to um, project 4.6 when you get there. Project worksheet 4.6. I'll see you there.